Thanks. I'll be in with a prayer. So, Dear Father, we uh, thank you for this time we have. It's pray that help us to use the time wisely, Lord, just to understand a little bit more about uh, abstract algebra, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. So you guys have any questions in particular? Mm. Let's see here. So, um, if I uh, I didn't bring my um, my laptop, but if I did, I could. Sh I'm about to post solutions for the first three sets of lecture problems, oh, so I'll do that sometime soon. I have them; I just haven't posted them. Okay. And uh, if I forget to tonight, just like shoot me an email or something, because I do mean to. Um, anyway. You know, one of the things I needed to, so to show, show that the order, you know, of G is equal to the order of G inverse for G in a group, this is a problem um, that a lot of people were pretty far off on. Um, and so the thing I noticed in order to, what I needed personally to be able to prove this with confidence, I needed to know a little theorem and the theorem I needed to know was that g to the g to the a times g to the b, right, is equal to g to the a plus b um, for a and b in the uh, integers. Now this this theorem, or as, as I called it, I called it a lemma because it, for me it was just a a necessary thing to to prove the order, but. It took me about three pages to work that out. There's a lot, a lot of cases to think about. Let me just show you one case. All right. Um, if A and B are both in the natural numbers, right? Um, <clears throat> so you can do induction on A. Or induction on B, let's say. So to start with, fix A. So what's that look like? Um, so I have G to the A times G, right? By definition, that's G to the A plus 1, right? That was our definition of power. And um, so that is equal to, so that implies that G to the A times G to the B is equal to G to the A plus B where b is equal to 1, right? Now, suppose inductively. That, um, you know, g to the a times g to the b is equal to g to the a plus b um, for some b in the natural numbers, right? Consider. g to the a times g to the b plus 1. Well, what's that equal to? By definition of exponent. Um, g to the a is g to the b. Right. And then, so that's by definition of the exponent, right? Definition of power. Right. I could just say definition of the power. Anyway, so um, that is, so this then is g to the a plus b. How do I know that? Uh, right. Induction. Yeah, by the induction hypothesis. You, you were, you were, I know that's what you have to say, but mm -hmm. I, I have the same problem. I, I often have trouble getting the words I need. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so then back again to the definition, right? This is g to the a plus b plus 1 by definition of power, right? And there you go. Now we've shown thus induction hypothesis holds um, for b plus 1. Therefore, g to the a times g to the b is equal to g to the a plus b for all a and b in the natural numbers. But when you start sorting through negative powers, just cases come out of the woodwork to prove it, all right? Um, 
I don't, I mean, if I had my laptop, I would project it and show you, but I really don't want to. I just wanted to warn you guys that there's actually quite a bit involved in proving that law, that like, uh, so law of exponents for a group, but it is true. And it's really just simple induction. It's tedious, but, but horrible. Once you have that, though, we can prove the, the we can, we can work the, the, you know, the, um, so for example, suppose, uh, g to the n is equal to e, and g to the j is not equal to e for, you know, j less than n, right? Positive. Let me just be a little bit stupid. j equals 1 to uh, n minus 1 for those cases, right? That's what is meant by saying that the order of the element is n, right? It's that g to the n is equal to e, and it's also that there's no smaller power which hits the identity. So <clears throat> you, you, know, you can consider, um, of course, g, um, you know, the g inverse, we can, we, can, we, can cl we can notice that g inverse, right, to the n power is by definition what? Um, <clears throat> Well, let's see here, how can I do this? Uh, oh, let me just start with something that's true rather than what I want, you know? What's true? We know what? We have this, right? This is given. So that implies that gn, g to the minus n is equal e times g to the minus n, right? But this is g to the n minus n using my lemma, which came at great expense. It, it really took me several hours to work that lemma out. Um, there may be a way of making my lemma smaller, but anyway. Um, and so what's that say? Well, that says that g to the 0 is g to the minus n. But what was, what was the definition of g to the minus n as well? Right, that was our definition of a negative exponent, was the inverse element raised to the exponent. And so that shows you what, that, what does that show us? Therefore, the order of G inverse is less than or equal to N. This does not allow you to conclude that the order of the inverse element is N. It could be greater. It could, it could be smaller. Like if G inverse, oh. you know, yeah, yeah. Now, um, you know, if, if, N, if N happened to be 8, it could be that like G inverse squared is E. So squared to the fourth is still E to the fourth, which is still E, for example. That's actually impossible given the data, but logically it's still there. Wait, can you say that again? If, for example, <clears throat> n was equal to 8, right? It, you could conceivably have the situation that this, um, you know, was equal to e. Then you could, you'd still have this as a consequence of that, consequence of that, right? I have not proved this in my homework solutions, but it is in fact also true that g to the m to the n is g to the mn. If I home in on a specific, like, both M and N are positive, or one's positive and one's negative, they may become reasonable test questions after I cut the cases down enough. Mm -hmm. but so by rights, we should have done this whole putting this theorem for the homework? You should have worried about it, because this is not something that's in the book, and it's not something that I proved in class nor stated in class, but it's something you needed for the homework. So somebody should have asked me, like, it seems like I need laws of group exponents. Did you want me to prove that? Well, actually, I didn't want you to prove it. I wanted this to be a nice homework problem that just involves what I'm doing here. Uh -huh. I didn't realize that we're missing that. <laughs> um, and that's part of, I mean, Gillian is great, but he also is a little bit freewheeling in places, for example, here. Um, OK, so anyway, we're not done. Then what? 
So we suppose there's a contradiction. So suppose like, suppose that G inverse um, to the J is equal to E for some J less than N. We wish to show that that forces a contradiction, right? So what's that mean? Um, in other words, G to the minus J is equal to E, right? What's that imply? What are we looking to contradict? We're looking to show that if G to the minus J is equal to E, that forces the order of G. Uh, we're, 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 we want to we show that if the order of the inverse is less than N, it forces the order of the element also to be less than N. That's what I'm, ex I'm expecting. <clears throat> so like if we just multiply this both sides by G to the J, what do you get? So this is again g to the j minus j, which is g to the zero, which is e, and that's equal to g to the j from the other side. Sorry, I'm a little bit sloppy here. <coughs> Excuse me. But that is a clear contradiction to you know the assumptions of the problem. Let me give it a label. Okay, hence there does not exist, you know, a J in one, two, da da da, n minus one for which G inverse, G inverse, G, G inverse to the J is equal to E. Therefore, the order of G inverse is equal to N. I think you were closer to doing this. You might have even done this, actually. Uh, yeah, I was somewhere around here. I used more words and less precise. Uh, but precise. you were assuming this somehow yeah. is what it boils down to, yeah. right? There's only like three people, maybe four people, who I saw were basically piecemeal trying to derive that from laws of the group. Um, but anyway. So that's just a just a comment I, I, I should make, and um, now it's been made. So is there a particular problem in Galen you guys like me to work out? Um, the ones from zero are mostly straightforward. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, after I had my three my stupid three page proof of the law of exponents, I thought. Man, there's got to be an easier way to do this. So I called my brother up and I asked him. I was like, you know, yeah, my brother's a he's, a, he's an algebraist actually. And um, this is his happy place. Mm -hmm. um, so and he basically his answer was the laws of exponents are tedious. Okay. He doesn't really know. A, I mean, there are ways to make it shorter than three pages. Mm -hmm. uh, doubtless what I have done is not the most clever way to do it. But there's ways to, to kind of, like you can prove a few lemmas, smaller sub lemmas to get to my lemma. Mm -hmm. I just got sick of trying to think of a clever way and just did it because I got, I spent hours on that this week. Anyway. Um, kind of things that bring you joy. I, did, I wanted to spend hours on other things, so not particularly. <laughs> but it's like a splinter in my mind. I have to fix it, you know. Any problems in particular, you guys? I can try. Chapter 3, number 54. So here um, we've got G, finite, and abelian. And what else? We have A and B are elements of G, right? 
and he defines for us the set generated by A and B, all right, to be, so this is kind of like a, you know, just a slight twist on, remember we've been talking about the cyclic subgroup generated by one element? Well, here's a cyclic subgroup. It's not a cyclic subgroup, but here's a, a subgroup generated by two elements. Um, I mean, it's not a cyclic subgroup. A cyclic subgroup has just one generator. This has two um, i and j elements of z integers. And he wants us to show that this is a subgroup of G. Prove that. And he says, what can you say about the order of A, B times the order? So he's, he's curious, what's the relation between the order of this and versus the order of uh, A versus the order of B? <clears throat> Let's see here. I think anyway, I just I would encourage you guys to look through my solution to that it's it's monstrously long, but if you read it, you'll find out that everything I'm doing in there is pretty trivial and just definitions. It's just it's just case by case by case and induction after induction after induction. And who knows, you might find an error in there. It's three pages long and well I try to be careful. Let's see here. I think to prove, a prove it's a group is probably not too hard, right? Um, let's see here. So first of all, notice that um, I equals to J equals to zero gives A I B J equals to what? A to the zero, B to the zero, which is by the definition, uh, by definition E times E, right? Which is E, right? So that's an element of this guy, which then is non-empty, right? So we got non-empty. Is it a subset? I think clearly this guy, right, is a subset of, of G since A, I, B, J is an element of G for any choice of I and J, right? You know, of all the things that I might omit from a proof, that's kind of first on my list. If, if I have to omit something, the fact that the set is a subgroup, a subset of the larger group, that's sometimes something you'll find I leave off proofs because sometimes I just, I forget to say it. Sometimes it's just obvious. Sometimes a little bit of both. Yeah. But to be picky, we should check that the subgroup, at least first, is a subset. Sometimes that's very helpful, like problem 37 with the weird determinant zero matrices, not a subset even of GL2. All right, anyway, so it's not empty. It's a subset. So we can either use one step or two step. Um, so let's suppose um, that X and Y are elements of this thing, right? What's that mean? Right, I'm going to just write it in a slightly different order. There exists I, J, K, L, in Z such that what? Just what you're telling me, X is equal to A, I, B, J, and Y is equal to? A, K, B. Right. Thus, um, <clears throat> um, X times Y is equal to what? It's equal to A, I, B, J, A, K, uh, B, L. Oh, it's very funny how much I was not intending for my initial talk to have anything to do with your question, per se. And yet it has everything to do, right? Because we're using the laws of expo uh -huh. <laughs> exponents. We need to know it for arbitrary integers which is a 
simple but tedious fact to prove about groups. All right, so anyway, now. Right, until I ask you to prove it again on test. Um, and then, but for homework, yeah. Unless the whole point, unless the homework question is simply about prove the law of exponents in a group. But it would be silly for me to ask that at this point since I'm about to publish a solution of it for you guys. <laughs> so now how can I do this? I mean, I just switched the order of this and that. How do I know I can do that? Right, because b to the j and a to the k are elements of the group g. And this is abelian. So the elements commute. So because it's abelian, I can do that. Otherwise, I couldn't. But then we use my lemma, which isn't, of course, just mine. Many people have suffered through that before. It's an innocent looking little homework problem in Dumb Foot, I noticed. Prove the laws of exponents for a group. It's just sitting there, so nice and small. It looks so simple. People don't realize how awful it is. Anyway, a to the i. Oh, but what's that? That's an element of a comma b as i plus k and j plus l are once more integers. So there you have it. It's closed under multiplication. Does that make sense? <coughs> Can we get inversion while we're at it? How about this? Notice um, a to the minus i, b to the minus j, right, is an element of a comma b, right? And a to the minus i times b to the minus j times a i b j is equal to what? And the opposite order also follows immediately because it's abelian, right? In an abelian group, a left inverse is automatically a right inverse. So therefore, x inverse is an element of AB. So we've showed that the set is closed under uh, multiplication and inversion. It's got an identity, so it's not empty. Right? So by the two-step subgroup test, we conclude that this contraption is, in fact, a subgroup of G. Now, if the group wasn't abelian, it wouldn't work, would it? Because non-abelian wouldn't allow us to commute these things, and we might not be able to get back to this form again, depending on the nature of the, the relations in the group. Let's see here. So this is, if G is like this, right? Um, I'm trying to think if there's a good example we can think of. Let's see, what was that? Was it U20 we talked about? What was U20? I'm trying to think here. Which, let's see, I, I want to find a group which is not cyclic. Let's see if I can exp see if I can kind of show you guys. I want something small though. I'm trying to remember. Uh, da, 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 da. Where's that thing? <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. I guess it was 20. The 20 is still kind of big. Let's look at it again. 
what was it, one, three, six is out because it's got a two in it, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen, seventeen, nineteen, is that it? All right, um, let's see here. What happens if we look at, for example, the subgroup that's generated by both 3 and 7? What would that give us? So like 3 to the i, 7 to the j, such that i and j are integers. What would that be? This is abelian, so this construction makes sense. What is it, you know? So first of all, you know, you can put j equals to zero. So of course it's like, it's like, I mean there's, of course there's e in here as we explained, right? Let's write it as one. <laughs> um, and so you got three, three squared is what? Right? And 27 is what? Seven, ooh, ooh. So, ah, uh, yeah, huh. Okay, then what's seven times, what's, uh, what's 27 times three, 21, which is one, oh, we're back again. <laughs> so this is kind of funny. This is actually also equal to this, right? Or this. <laughs> Either 3 or 7 generate the same subgroup of U20. I chose poorly. Let's just try this again. Let's try like 3 and let's choose something that's not in this list, right? Like 11? Yeah, sure. So of course we get the 1, we get the 3, we get the 9, we get the 7, because those are powers of 3. But then what else do we get? One. Yeah, oh, 11. yeah, 11, right? 121 is 11 squared, which is what? 121, which is 1. Okay, so 11. But we also get things like 3 times 11, right? 33, which is what? 13. 13, yeah. And what else do we get? We get things like um, 9 times 11, right? Which is what? 99, which is 19, right? Is there anything left to get? 17, let's see here, what else do we got? This was 3 squared, right? Um, goodness gracious, I'm, I'm going to guess that 3 cubed times 11 is what we're missing, isn't it? That's 20, uh, what is 3 cubed? 3 cubed is 7, right? 7 times 11, 77, 17. So this is of course U20 again. So while U20 is not cyclic, it can be generated by two elements if you pick the right two. Can you say anything about the order of A versus B versus... Looks like, well, they, they could be equal, right? I mean, this 3 has order 4, order 4. This has order 4, right? This time it has order eight. Um, of course, the order of three is what? Is four. The order of 11 is two. So the order of, could be the order of A and the order of B divide the order of A? That's what it looks like, yeah. The order of A and the order of B divides the order of the group generated by both A and B, yeah. That has to do with a theorem we haven't gotten to yet, but this is because it's not hard to see that the 
cyclic subgroup generated by A, right, is a subgroup of AB. And one of the things we're going to learn is that the order of a subgroup has to divide the order of a group. Oops, I shouldn't tell you that yet. But anyway, I think that that, that theorem is brought to you from, you're not supposed to know that yet, don't use it. Um, I mean, you're not allowed to use that yet. Because that is from, uh, that's from chapter seven, which is after test one. So that's like, it's forbidden knowledge. It's forbidden jutsu. Or jutsu, excuse me, what am I saying? Anyway, questions? <clears throat> That's a nice little problem. So what would you like to know about permutations and isometries? I mean, I can tell you this much. Dn, right? So this is the dihedral group of order n, right? Or rather, order 2n, isn't it? I to I, so I explained to you guys, we can write this as like the identity element, right? And then a rotation, rotation squared. Da, 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 da. rotation to the n minus 1, um, a reflection, um, a ref rotation times the reflection, the rotation squared times the reflection, the rotation to the n minus 1 times the reflection. So you can count that the order of dn is 2n. Um, so we've, I've explained these things sort of geometrically, right? But if you look at them, they're also, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, you know, these are, op these, are, these are transformations in the plane. So you could, for what it's worth, of course we have the rotations, right? The rotations is just what? this part of it. So that's, um, I suppose technically that's dn intersected with, what did I call it, orth. Um, n is equal to 2 r. I think that was my, that's still not quite right. I'm an idiot. I mean, the orthogonal group also includes reflections, so I'm, I'm sorry. What I was trying to get at here is the <coughs> there is a subgroup of rotations, right? And you could actually write these as like t, um, you know, t of x, uh, t of x comma y equals to like a matrix r times x, y, right? And let's say the rotation, um, Uh, and, and so the, the, this rotation matrix could actually, you could actually use something like cosine of 2 pi over n, um, sine of 2 pi over n, right? Uh, minus sine of 2 pi over n. I think I got it right. Oh, I could be off by a sign here, S-I-G-N. So that, that's a rotation matrix by that angle, 2 pi over n, and... Um, so you could actually give that as a formula for the linear transformation, which rotates vectors in the plane like that. And we could study the rotations in the dihedral group in terms of those kinds of formulas if we wanted to. Okay. But we don't want to, right? We don't want to do that. Because it's so, so very much easier to look at it in terms of this guy, right? Um, the homework problem I gave you guys, right? I had, it's got x, y squared equals to 1, and x to the n, well, I guess it's x to the fourth equal to 1, y squared equals to 1, right? Yes. Don't be fooled. This is the same thing. Check this out. So that's x, y, x, y equals to 1. Multiply by um, y on both sides. What does this give us?
Did I do that right? Oh, I'm sorry. I multiply by x inverse on both sides. I'm an idiot. So y, x, y equals to x inverse, right? In other words, if you want to make the identification between the homework problem and what we did in class, all that's going on really, right, is that y is the f and x is what I've been calling r. I wasn't really trying to change notation on you guys. I just copied the problem down from somewhere. Some mathematician I know. <laughs> but anyway, so, yeah. But the cool thing is, the way the homework problem characterizes D4 is entirely equivalent to drawing the pictures with the rotations and the flips and everything. They're, they are the same group. So. so you guys have another question? Let me just... I mean, I understand what you're trying to get. You want to understand what's the difference between the centralizer and the center, right? Yeah. They seem very similar, but yeah, you know they're not this. Right. Well, let's 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 put the definitions on the board and see if we can just see it. Okay. In fact, one of these is automatically a subset of the other. Okay. Let's find out which. <laughs> so the centralizer of A is G and G. All right, such that aga, AG is equal to GA. All right, and so it's this, let's put this in words. This is the set of all group elements which commute with the particular element A. All right. In contrast, the center of G is what? <clears throat> this is G in G such that <clears throat> Um, gx is equal to xg for all x in g. So in other words, the center is the collection of elements in g which commute with all elements in G. I said one was a subset of the other. I'm not entirely convinced of that. <laughs> See, I would like to say that, yeah, I mean, I would like to say that C of A 
is a subset of z, c, subset of z of g. But what's the problem with that? What if there must what, there might exist there might exist b in, in g such that what <clears throat> such that a b right um, well such that um, b g is not equal to g b for you know some g in the centralizer of a. I mean, just because uh, G commutes with A doesn't mean G necessarily commutes with everything, does it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but if something, but if the things in there that commute with everything, right? If something commutes with everything, it necessarily commutes with something. So it follows that the other way is true. The center of the group is a subset, subset. Indeed, it's a subgroup, in fact, of the centralizer of A for each A. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a homework problem which characterizes the center in terms of centralizers. Uh, problem 15. You're asked to show that the center of G is the intersection of all centralizers. So in fact, number 15 asks us to show the center of G is the, un is the intersection over A and G of C of A. Chapter 3. So to prove that, how would you do it? Let's see. Okay. I would say y a equals to a y for all a and g. <laughs> Just to <laughs> so therefore. <laughs> Therefore, y is an element of CA for all A and G, right? Therefore, y is an element of the intersection. What's it take for something to be an intersection? It has to be an everything forming the intersection, right? So that's the case here. So therefore, the center of the group is a subset of the intersection um, of the centralizers. <clears throat> That's the, well, that's half of the homework problem. What's the other half? <coughs> All right. So that implies what? That implies that Z is an element of CA, right, um, for each. A in G, right? By the definition of intersection. Did you pan over, Audrey? Oh, sorry. It's cool. And was that in there before, the purple part? Yes. Okay. Purple. Now we're, you got me? All right. So that's what we got. What does that mean, though? ZA, right, is equal to AZ for each. A and G, right? Woohoo! Therefore, what? We have gained entrance to the club that is known as the center. Because Z commutes with everything in the group. Therefore, Z is in the center. Sorry for Z's puns. All right. <laughs> so, hence. Well, thus, I used, thus uh, I used hence already too much. So thus, uh, the center, excuse me, thus the intersection 
over A and G of the centralizer of A is a subsoup. Subsoup. Listen to me. Subsoup. What's a subsoup? I don't know. I didn't. I didn't drink my soup today. I guess that's my, my guilty conscience. Wife made me delicious soup, and I haven't drank it yet. Let's see here. Or eat. Eat. eat the, is it drink or eat? I don't know. You guys tell me. Eat. Eat. Yeah. I used. To, I used to say eat, but I've been informed it's drink since I've joined Asian culture, cultural <laughs> circles. Circles. Depends on whether or not you use a spoon. I like it. What do you think? Drink or eat soup? Bite? You say bite? <laughs> <coughs> There's number 15. So there actually, Audrey, is a good, really better answer to your question is that this is the connection between the center and the centralizers. In that homework problem that you guys had, did you already turn that, in, turn that one in? I think this might have been lecture two where you're asked to calculate the centralizer and the center of GL2. The way I found the center, in part, basically was what I did was I just looked for both of the A and B conditions holding. OK, in truth, I already knew that the center was multiples of the identity, because I've worked the problem before. But if you look at it, you can see A and B together give C. It's this at work, really. Anyway, I shut up. I think I have a child's birthday party I'm late to. Oh, yes, I must go. So you can, you can hit it. it. We're not recording now, right? <laughs>